Good morning. I'm excited to be here today to kick off a new series we're calling Christmas Perspectives. When we have one vantage point to an event, we have a limited perspective. We have the opportunity to take a look from a variety of angles. We get a clearer and more thorough picture of the event. And just like this Patrick Hughes artwork popping out when we look at it from different perspectives, the events in the Bible will come alive when we do the same. The birth of Jesus is one of the most significant events in history. And in this series, we'll be looking at the story of Christmas, the birth of Jesus, from five unique perspectives. Pastor Kevin is going to look at Christmas through the eyes of wise men and shepherds and and angels and God the Father and Christians. And when we do this, we'll be able to see Jesus with greater clarity than ever before. And today we're going to start by looking at Christmas through the eyes of parents Being a parent, I can tell you, and many of you here know the same thing, the anticipation of expecting a child is a very complex mix of emotions. From uncertainty about what life will be like to to how the pregnancy is going to go to how the delivery is going to go, to, to what's going to happen along the way and what's this child going to be like and how am I going to parent them? My wife and I read every book that we could possibly find, and it didn't do us any good. (laughs) But can you imagine what it would be like for Joseph and Mary as they were expecting the arrival of the Son, the Son of God, so much more than anything we could possibly imagine We're going to look at a couple of passages today, and they're going to be a little bit longer, so I encourage you, if you've got a Bible with you, to bring it out. We're going to read through Matthew 1 right now. We're going to start in verse 18, and a little bit later, we're going to read Luke 1, starting in verse 26, But, but we're going to read an extensive account here, and this is Joseph's angle that I want us to look at first. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged, sorry, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce, divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. As I read through that the first time, I thought, What unique perspective would Joseph give us? And if you're a note taker, that's the first filling in your bulletin. What unique perspective would Joseph give us? I was thinking through the the plans of his life and, and how he was looking at what his future would hold. And I thought about how most of us make plans for our lives. I think it starts as small children. We plan maybe our play date or what we're going to do after school on a day or or what we're going to watch 
on a Saturday morning when we get up early. Those are the big plans for me as a kid is what Sunday morning cartoons I got to watch on our sweet black and white TV. But then as you get into high school, your plans change a little bit. Maybe you have plans for the weekend or plans for your dances or, or plans for what classes you're going to take or plans for what you're going to do in college. And then in college, you make plans. You, you decide on a course of study. You maybe change it a couple times like I did. You switch from school to school, but you've got your plans about how this is gonna launch you off into your life. And then you embark upon your career and you have your plans for your career, where you're gonna start, where you're gonna be in one year, three years, five years, how you're gonna retire before you're 40 or whatever your plan may be. And then maybe you get married and you have your plans about what that will look like and what your family is going to be like and how many kids you're going to have. We have plans just as Joseph probably had a plan. I think he would say to us in retrospect for sure that God's plan is better than our plan. 11 years ago, my wife and I embarked upon the adoption, foster and adoption process. We called the kinship center and said, we we're ready to adopt a kid, so let's get the classes going and let's start doing this. And then we quickly found out that my wife was pregnant with our youngest daughter. We weren't expecting her. We hadn't necessarily planned for her, but I can tell you today that God's plan was better than our plan. When an angel appears to Joseph and says, your wife is pregnant and this is the son of God, I got to imagine in that moment he wasn't thinking, this is the plan I want. But in retrospect, I'm sure he could say, God's plan is better than our plan. I believe that Joseph would always also tell us that it's not always easy. That following God's plan, which, which I really believe we can say is greater than our plan, will not always be easy. So our daughter that we hadn't really been planning for turned to and we said, okay, let's revisit this foster and an adoption process. And so we did the contacted kinship center again. We did our home study, we, we took our classes, we had our background checks done, we got as prepared as we thought we could possibly get. We got a call that there was a boy to bring into our home and so we got all the final things done in our, in our home for him to come and, and then a couple days after uh, we got home in that we were out of town, we got home he wasn't coming and they hadn't worked out the time he was gonna come and so I called and they said, oh, we left you a voicemail. That boy is not coming into your home. God's plan is better than our plan. But then we got another call. And that was a call to introduce us to Finn. A little five-year-old boy who had had a horrible, horrible five years. I gotta tell you, he's sitting over there right now and I asked him, can I share about our experience with the church because I really believe that they need to hear a bit of our story because I believe that they need to know that sometimes following God's plan is not easy. I gotta tell you, these last seven years have been hard. They've been hard for him They've been hard for me. They've been hard for my wife. They've been hard for my three daughters. We know this is God's plan. We know that God wanted Finn in our home. But I can also tell you that we know that it's not easy. Joseph was tasked with fathering the Son of God. What kind of pressure would that put on you? How hard could that be? Following God's plan won't always be easy. 
but it will always be right. I think Joseph would also tell us that we need to trust in God. Specifically when it's not easy, specifically when it isn't going the way that we think it should go, specifically when maybe we're questioning whether this is right. On those hard, difficult days of following God's plan, that's when we need to trust in God. I know for Joseph, there had to be plenty of days where he had to be reminded that God's plan is better than his plan, that he had to be reminded that it won't always be easy, that he had to be reminded that he needed to trust in God. That was the truth for Joseph 2,000 years ago, and it's the truth for us today. And while Joseph and Mary both had the same general experience and that they were going to parent God's son, I truly believe that they have different perspectives that come into this. So let's read a little bit about Mary's story. In Luke 1, verses 26 through 38, we read, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What unique perspective would Mary bring? think she would say to us today that sometimes following God is scary. As a parent, I can tell you that parenting children is scary. From labor to giving birth to the first day at home without the nurses and lactation consultants telling you what to do and how to fix the, the feeding issues with changing those first diapers and, and wondering how we're going to get through to watching your child learn to walk and stumble around, afraid that they're going to hit their head on something. Parenting is scary. As we go through the years, and are they going to fit in school, and are they going to learn, are they going to be able to, to develop the way we'd like to? And then we get them into high school, we get them into college, and we send them off into this world, and we have less control than we thought we had before. Did we build the right foundation? Did we teach them enough right from wrong? Are they gonna be okay in this world? Parenting is scary when you have an average kid. You're being called upon to give birth to the savior of the world, to raise him and guide him, that's got to be scary. 
I believe that Mary would also tell us to, that God will give you what you need. In Luke 2, 6 through 7, when, when they're heading off to, to go uh, register for the census, they find themselves without a place to sleep. And it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. I think often for us today, when we think of God providing for us and all that we need, I think we often think of him providing for us the way we want and the way we expect. I'm sure Mary and Joseph, as they're thinking about how is God going to provide for us, are thinking, well, we'll get there. Give us a nice room with a nice bed and a warm shower. A heated blanket, I don't know. He didn't provide that way. But God did provide. He, He provided them a stable. He provided them with something to wrap the baby Jesus in. He provided them with a manger to lay him in. I think Mary would tell us that God will give you what you need. In verse 38 of Luke 1, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I believe that Mary would tell us to make ourselves available to God. Some years ago, I was given the opportunity to to run my first triathlon. You don't run a triathlon, right? You swim a triathlon, you bike a triathlon, and you run a triathlon. I had done pretty good with my biking and my running, not so much with the swimming. Uh, My swimming pool that I used was at the Elks Lodge. It was maybe like 20 yards long. And so I'd gotten to this place where I would swim across, and then I'd check my time. I'd take a break. I'd swim back across, and I'd take a break, and that was my swimming adventures. Well, the triathlon came. It was the Wildflower Triathlon. And it was kind of a neat thing because the night before the triathlon, I met with a group of people called Multi-Sport Ministries. And there's a bunch of athletes who are Christians who would come together. And so we came together as a group and we just kind of shared stories and life with each other. And, And then we had a time to pray. And we would go around in the group and share what our prayer requests are. And then someone else in the group or several people would pray for them. So one person had a, a, a knee that wasn't working very well, and they had knee surgery. And this was their first, first triathlon after their knee surgery. And so they asked for us to pray that their knee would hold up. It was a man. So he said, would you pray for my knee, that it would be strong during the race? And we said, absolutely. Let's pray for your knee. And we did. And then there was a woman who had had a shoulder that wasn't feeling too well, and, and in a triathlon, you actually use your shoulder quite a bit, not only in the swimming, but in cycling as well. It's a big thing. And so we prayed for her that her shoulder would hold up. We went around the group and it got to me and I thought, ah, I should probably pray for my swimming because I'm just not good. Well, I didn't pray for my swimming because somehow God put on my heart a different prayer request. The group that night prayed for me to be used by God the next day. I don't know where that came from other than it had to have been from God because I'm an incredibly competitive person and I had trained hard for this triathlon and the truth is I don't know that I really wanted to be used by God. I think I really wanted to have a good time and have an enjoyable race. Well, the next morning... I go down there excited for the race, unsure what will unfold. Get my wetsuit on. The race starts. I jump in the water and I go, oh no. I should have prayed for my swimming. (laughs) I made it about 20 yards, the width of my Elks Lodge pool, and I was done. Luckily, there was a lot of lifeguards on paddle boards and canoes and kayaks, and so I found myself zigzagging between them. A swim that probably should have taken five to seven minutes, no joke, took me 23 minutes. As you can see, I survived, I didn't drown, and it was thanks to all those great lifeguards there. I got out into the transition area, took off my wetsuit, and hopped on my bike. 
tackling this race, and I was doing a mountain bike sprint triathlon a little bit shorter. I don't even know how long it was. Maybe 30 seconds into the ride, there's this lady in front of me stopped. I'm like, what are you stopped here for? And she said, my bike's not working. And so I was like, God is providing me a way to be used. So I hop off my bike, I set it down, I take a look at her bike and determine in a matter of seconds that her rear um, quick release was just not tight. I straightened up her wheel, tightened it up, and she was on her way. And I was like, look at that. God used me, it took me 30 seconds, and now I'm on to my race. This is fantastic. Well, in this race specifically, there's this nice hill you get to climb. And in the mountain bike triathlon, you, you do these couple of loops. You get up to the top on pavement, and you come down on gravel and dirt, and then you go back up. Well, in my second loop, I'm just like, I'm ready. Now there's no more hills for me. I'm going to just kill it here. I come down the hill, and I get just about to the bottom of the hill, and I look over to the right. And there's a lady laying down off the side of the road. I slam on my brakes, I run up, back up to her, and I, and I say, are you okay? And then I look, and her body is just road rash, like the gravel has just scraped her up. Well, she had a water pack on her back, so I, I took it off, and I actually used some of the water, and I sprayed it off and tried to clean some of the dirt out. And then I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And so I took that moment in the middle of this race, and I prayed for this woman on the side of the road. And as I had finished, she said, how's the other woman? And I said, the other woman? I don't see any other woman. I thought maybe she hit her head. Maybe she's not thinking clearly. There's no other woman. She said, no, I ran into another woman. And I said, I don't see it. And I'm looking, and I'm looking right around her. And then I look up, hundreds of feet up the hill. And there's a woman off to the side of the road behind a bush. I say, I gotta go. I run up the hill, left my bike down there, and I get up to her and I was like, are you okay? And she said, no, I'm not. She said, I can't, I can't move. She said, I don't know, with my lower back, it's my hips. I, I, I can't feel anything down there. Now, I gotta tell you, I, I overlooked a major thing here at this point, and I didn't pray for this woman. If I could go back, I would have done so. But I just stopped and I ran up the hill to the last person I saw with the radio and I said, there's a woman down there who needs help bad. So they sent their little golf cart down there and they assessed it and they took care of it. And she was hurt badly. I gotta tell you, when I prayed the night before that God would use me the next day, I had no idea he would provide me with three opportunities. I had no idea to the extent to which he would use me. He used me beyond what I could have imagined. Later that week, I got an email from the lady I prayed with who thanked me for taking the time to pray for her. We exchanged a few different emails and I could be reminded that God truly used me beyond what I could have imagined. Mary, as she's told that she is going to be the mother to the Son of God, who's going to bring salvation to all humankind, probably couldn't have imagined how greatly God would use her. Despite the fact that Mary would have lived her life in this process in a scary place, she knew that God was gonna use her because she made herself available. She said, let the Lord's will be done in my life. What might Mary and Joseph ask us today? I think they might ask us, can you hear God when he's speaking to you? Now, I'm not to say that it's not possible, but God appeared to them in person as an angel and appeared to them in a dream through Joseph's dream. We might not get that. But today we have the opportunity to be connected to God through the Holy Spirit. And I believe that one of the greatest ways to do that is through what we call here a spiritual marker of passionate prayer. It's through us constantly and consistently going to God in prayer, both sharing with him our 
feelings, our thoughts, our concerns, our, our needs, but also quietly listening for him to tell us what he wants to say to us. I believe that Mary and Joseph would ask us, can you hear God when he's speaking to you? I think they might ask us, do you care more about what people think than what God thinks? You know, the fact that Mary was pregnant before she really should have been in the eyes of the people around her. There would have been chatter. There would have been people around town talking about this pregnancy outside of wedlock. And Joseph had Mary had the opportunity to think about what people think or to think about what God would think. You know, for me today, this comes up all the time. Do I want to invite my neighbor to church who, who might think I'm some kind of crazy Christian and I'm going to have to see them day in and day out for years to come? Do I care more about what they think or what God thinks when he says, that's my son, that's my daughter? When I may be trying to fit in with people and speaking in a way that I shouldn't. Maybe I'm, I'm gossiping or, or speaking crudely because I want to fit in and I want people to like me. Do I care more about what people think or what God thinks? Mary and Joseph had to consider that. And I believe today we do too. Are you willing to trust God when it does not make sense to you? I mean, can you imagine what Joseph and Mary are going through? Like, what, I'm gonna be pregnant with a baby from the Holy Spirit? And Joseph's saying, wait, you want me to be the dad to a baby that I didn't help conceive? Often, God wants us to trust in him. And the times that it doesn't make sense are all the more the times to trust in him. I believe that Mary and Joseph would ask us, will you make the right decision even when it's difficult? I talked earlier about this foster and adoption process that my family undertook. In the first season of that, Finn was our foster son. And we got to see firsthand the difficulties of that. We now got to the place where it was time to decide whether to adopt him or not. We made the decision. We knew it'd be difficult. But I really believe God said to us, are you willing to make the right decision even when it is difficult? The years since then have been difficult as well. And my wife and I have an opportunity each and every day, in fact, many, many times a day, to make that decision over and over again because we know that this is God's plan. We know that God put this boy in our family and we have the privilege of parenting him, specifically when it is difficult. Not everybody here is gonna be called to parent a child who's gone through early childhood trauma and everything that comes with that. But everybody here is going to be called to do things difficult. Will you make the right decision even when it's difficult? I believe that when we make ourselves available to God, when we get to a place where we can hear his voice, we can follow him we can trust in him and we can do what's right even when it's difficult. And when we do, God is gonna use us far beyond anything we can imagine. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for the call upon my life and Shannon's life. I thank you that you've called us to do something hard, but you have met our needs each and every step of the way. I pray that you would show all of us how you want to use us. Father, I pray that we would make ourselves available to you on a daily basis, that we would trust in you when it's difficult and when it's not. Lord, would you allow us to hear your voice so clearly that we know that your plan is better than our plan. Use us in this world, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.